The following interview was conducted with uh, Professor Felix Haas for the Purdue University Library's Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, June 26, 2007, at the TV studio in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Dr. Haas, tell us a little bit about your early years from coming to the States and a few yes, of the uh, I was born in Vienna, Austria, and never finished high school, actually. And I left in 1938. And I spent a year in England. I left a year in England waiting for an American visa to come through. And then I, in the fall of 39, I came from England to the United States. And uh, uh, really the first four or five years of my experience were fairly typical of the immigrants' experience in the United States. I mean, I landed in New York. I can't remember if it was Ellis Island or not today, but I did land in New York. And then I got a job in New Jersey and uh, worked there for four years, a little more than four years, and and really, uh, I'd always appreciated the United States, but as an, as an immigrant, uh, you go through several stages. First, you admire everything, uh, then you are critical of, of the things that you're not uh, familiar with, and then you really become part of the American environment and, and appreciate it completely. Uh, my knowledge of the United States was really based on reading authors. I was Sinclair Lewis, Upton Sinclair, Theodor Dreiser. They're quite familiar in Austria where I grew up. I, of course, I read, read them in translations. I, I came with an image of the United States. And um, the country really was better than its image, and the image you got from reading these people. And I, and I lived in New Jersey. I, had a variety of jobs there. Uh, I was, uh, among other things, one of the things I'm proud of, I worked, I was, I'm a member of the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union, which I obtained that, that membership in one of my jobs. And, and then in, in uh, January 43, I was drafted into the Army. And, uh, and uh, when you're drafted in the, in the Army as a non-citizen, it speeds up your, the process of becoming a citizen. So I became a citizen that, that summer while I was stationed at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And uh, it, was an, it was an unusual situation. I had my, my witnesses, my, my first sergeant and my staff sergeant, and uh, the judge didn't have time for us right away. So I had to, I felt I owed them a favor since they were so nice to take me there. And I, I took him to a bar and bought him a drink or two. The only problem was by the time we got to the judge, I was not sure how credible they would be as witnesses, but he worked out okay. I became a citizen of the United States. Uh, and then I, I was, and I, by the way, I was one of the people whom the Army placed properly. They, had, they recognized my mathematical ability, and I was I made into a, a control, fire controller in the artillery where he used mathematics to some extent. I was from, from McCoy, we went to Fort Raleigh, Kansas, which I remember mostly as being cold and windy. And when I looked at the, at the atlas, I noticed there was not a single hill between the North Pole and Kansas. And then I went from went, went, then I went to Fort Bragg, and from there we went overseas. I, I was with a heavy artillery battalion that landed in Normandy, and we were part of the Third Army. and. Uh, and uh, I eventually got into Germany, and I was discharged in March of '46. That, and I was, at that point, I was admitted to MIT, even though I didn't have a high school degree, just on the basis of tests, for which I will always be grateful. And really, from then on, my life was easy. That's so far I've described to you the hard part of my life. From then on, it became very easy. How uh, did you happen to select MIT? I, I had an uncle, my only relative in the United States was an uncle, uh -huh. who had been working in a bank in Vienna. And uh, he got a, when he got to the United States, he got a PhD in economics at Harvard, which is, of course, they're both MIT and Harvard and Cambridge. And, um, and so, I mean, it was natural for me when I came out to go to, to, to Boston and go to MIT. And I started out as a physicist. I got a bachelor's degree in physics. But I found out that I really didn't like, I'm, I'm really not very handy. I didn't like to do experiments. There was a breakage fee at MIT, and I was the, the, I was the first one who 
I set a record how much I broke in the chemistry labs, and then I, as a physicist, I was given, I had to, to real, I mean, I had to give real equipment, and I had to do real, you know, work on the apparatus, and I had to blow glass and, and nail things together, and I really was not very good at this. So I, when I after my bachelor's degree in physics, I got out, I shifted to applied mathematics, and then to, got a PhD in mathematics in 52. And uh, also from MIT. I have three degrees from MIT, mm -hmm. bachelor's, master's, and PhD. And at that stage, uh, I had a vision of myself as a teacher, as a college teacher in a small college. I had seen movies about ivy covered walls and small cars. It seemed very appealing to me. Uh, but I, it turned out I had some aptitude for mathematics, and I got a, after a year, I spent a year at Lehigh, and then I, I was offered a research after. instructorship at Princeton, mm -hmm. the Henry Burchard Fan Instructorship, which is sort of a, still was and still is in mathematics, the, the most desirable post-PhD appointment in the country. And uh, when I went to Princeton, I started thinking of myself as someday being a great mathematician, and my children would read about me the books. But then I, after I spent two years in Princeton, I spent a year at Connecticut, and then I went to Wayne State University, where I became chairman of the department. And at, at some stage, I don't know exactly when I admitted it to myself, I found out that I really had more aptitude for administration than mathematical research. And uh, uh, I apparently did a reasonably good job at Wayne State, because when Purdue was looking for a head for the mathematics department, Purdue had a, appointed a committed Purdue had a crisis in mathematics at that point, and a lot of people had left, and the department was in disarray, so President Hofti appointed a national committee to advise him. And that national committee picked me and said, Purdue should hire me for the, to be head of the Division of Mathematical Sciences, and I was delighted to accept, of course. The first few times I came here, I came by train, and I'm still unhappy that the the train between Detroit and Lafayette no longer exists. It was a very convenient way of traveling, 250 miles or 300, mm -hmm. 300 miles. And I was actually hired in the summer of 61, but in the fall of 61, I commuted between Detroit and Lafayette. And in fact, I was already responsible for decisions made here and for the recruitment here, but I was still an employee at Wayne State University that fall. And then I moved technically, I became, I moved, became head of the department in, in January 62. At Purdue. At Purdue. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was only head of the department for about uh, eight months when I was approached to become a dean by the then academic vice president, Paul Sheena. And I first rejected this idea because I felt my job in mathematics, building mathematics, had not been completed yet. I felt I, uh, I really should spend more time there. But then, uh, uh, well, after, after it was offered me for a second time, I accepted, and the School of Science technically started in the spring of 63. Now, that was a, a new school? or It was a new school. What happened is the, uh, it was a solution to a prob to a strange solution to a problem. The, the central administration was unhappy with what was happening to the science department and what was previously had been the School of Humanities, or Science and, Edu science and, and Education, whatever it was called then. Social science or and something. They first had moved out the mathematics department. When I came in, the mathematics had been put into engineering. And then they were going to move out the physics department. At that point, they decided they couldn't move out one department at a time from the dean. That who, who they felt was neglecting those areas, so they started a new mm -hmm. school. And so I was the first dean of the School of Science. Very good. And, we, and uh, so within about a year and a half after I came, I had, had to start looking for a new head of mathematics, which I did. And, uh, and I had a lot of fun in all Building, these jobs. You built the school. I built the school. Hopefully I built the school. Mm -hmm. and I, I, uh, I managed to get good people to help me, which I think is the key in a university. Uh, I mean, traditional supervision is not possible in teaching and research. 
So what you have to do is get the best people and then leave them alone. It's always been my philosophy. Mm -hmm. And various managers around town will point it out to their bosses. That that's what Haas is saying. Hire good people, then leave them alone, don't interfere. But uh, I felt that was really the, the way to do it. And, uh, and when you got the School of Science, were there some departments that were put into that initially? Or how yeah, did, initially how did I got formula? four departments. Uh -huh. Chemistry, biological sciences, physics, and mathematics. And incidentally, the biological sciences department was quite good. It was one of the contributions of President Hofti was a, was a chemist by trade. And he recognized the importance of molecular biology before other people did. So he started building that in the early 50s, before I had no hand in this. And of course, that's one of the important things administration should do, is to recognize changes in the state of knowledge and in societal needs and react to them. And so I, I inherited the Department of Biological Sciences physics, chemistry, and mathematics. And, uh, as, and, and then I, I broke the division of mathematical science into three parts, three departments, uh, computer science, statistics, and mathematics. And uh, the, the management techniques that I used it, initially, there was a joint budget for the three departments, but the three faculties set their own curricula. And after about two years, they became full-fledged departments with their own budget and all the mm -hmm. rights and privileges and duties of a department. And I think that worked out reasonably well. Be really, again, because I got good people. I got uh, Sam Conti, who had computer sciences, who was um, uh, just an outstanding department head. And again, Shanti Gupta in statistics, who was a very good department head also. And then, at some point, it became clear that the university needed to more, do more in geology and the related areas than it was doing at the time. Traditionally, Purdue had, had uh, two or three geologists in the S School of Civil Engineering. But uh, these people were unhappy there. They felt they weren't attra attracting enough majors and so forth. So I would guess about uh, 67. It may have been 68, I'm not sure. We started the Department of Geosciences. As so many things at Purdue, we started them with little in resources. Uh, I was given the three, actually four geologists from the Department in Civil Engineering and something like $30,000. And then I found a little more money in the School of Science. So really, started with about $60,000 in four geologists. And just by comparison, when we had that idea, I visited places nationally. That's one of the things I learned what to do. And I've, MIT had, had the same idea, only they got a million dollar gift to start the Department of Earth Sciences. But uh, we, we did well, I hope. We got mm -hmm. Gunnar Kulrat, who was another very interesting man. He was a Norwegian who had fought in the Norwegian underground against the Germans. And he was a middle distance runner. He had, if, if there had been Olympics in 1940, he would have gone for the 1500 meters. Wow. He was a worldwide runner. But, so, but this discipline and work habit that serves athletes, he carried into his work as a scientist. He, at the time when I hired him, he worked for the Carnegie Foundation in Washington, D.C. And just it may amuse you what convinced me that, that, that after hiring, I asked various people, and the rec one, somebody recommended Kulrat saying, he's a totally unreasonable man. If you're very smart and work day and night, he'll be moderately satisfied with you. That's when I hired him. It, <laughs> it turned out to be a correct prediction. And uh, he, built the, he built the department. He built the department. Mm -hmm. He got some very good people, and within well, but in all these departments, very rapidly, uh, was, they, they reached national stature. Within, within six years of the founding of the Geoscience Department, they had more research support per faculty member than any other ge geology department in the Big Ten, most of which had been in existence for 50 years. So they were a very good, very good department. And of course, uh, I was not only concerned with... Uh, 
hiring department heads, I was concerned with getting very good faculty. And, uh, and of course, the way you do this in administration, you don't interfere with the departments, but the department heads can sense and understand what pays off in dealing with you. And they very soon figured out that if they got good people, they were treated well. And I, was, I, was, I had a weakness for that. And that worked. Mm -hmm. And um, One of the things that you addressed when we talked earlier is about the Mass Science Building, your involvement in getting yeah, that. We got a, yeah, uh, that is, um, we got, uh, just after I became head of the Division of Mathematical Sciences, well, actually I was already dean, I guess, the, the National Science Foundation still had a program where they sup supplied money for buildings. That was abolished uh, soon thereafter. And so we, we applied and got a grant, and I think it was a very cheap building for the university. The whole the mathematical sciences building cost the university, I think, three and a half million dollars, and I got a two million dollar grant from the National Science Foundation. So it was, worked out very well. I must confess, it's not the most beautiful of buildings. It reminds me, always reminds me of a hospital where you can see the ambulances driving under it, but uh, they had, as a dean, on, even as a provost, they had little influence on Purdue architecture. There was a, a long-standing tradition <laughs> where the trustees worked with, the, uh, with a certain architect, who was a good architect, actually. I mean, he built some very interesting buildings in other places, but he was... Uh, at well, Purdue, when he put in a few windows, he apologized for it. He, he said, I'm sorry I had to put in windows in this brick wall. He realizes that they don't, it's not what one should do. But, the, yeah. but anyhow, that's, I got help with that building. And actually, we, we did well with other buildings. We got, a, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation that paid for an underground extension of the physics building where accelerator was put. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes I'm, I'm cheap enough to use whatever persuades people to get my way. <laughs> President Hofti really didn't want that um, the, the mall torn up in front of the horn uh, that is now Hofti Hall. But the physicists desperately wanted their accelerator there. So the argument that was finally w w w won out, and I'm, you must remember that was the 60s. Mm -hmm. I went to the executive building as a dean. I said, look, I said, not only is this a good place for an accelerator, but this is, this is an excellent air raid shelter for, 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 the, for the executive building, because it's right next door, mm -hmm. and you will have t 10 feet of concrete on top of it. You couldn't find a better air raid shelter. It then sold the building. <laughs> so I, got a, I got, the, got a building for the physics department. We got a new wing for the chemistry de department. Uh, and uh, we, we got an area in, in the biological sciences building, which had been unassigned by the time when I became dean. So I, I was involved there in a battle with agriculture, with Earl Butts, as a matter of fact, for that space, which I won. I got the space for the biological sciences. Mm -hmm. And um, that's... You know, that, that has to do with one of the functions of administration. If I made, from my point of view, a university is a place where, where scholars and young meet, people meet for mutual benefit. That's my definition of a university. And academic administration really only has three functions. One is to provide resources so that they can meet each other. Secondly is, is quality, and that's getting resources for buildings, so that's part of it. Then there's quality control. And then there, there's uh, occasionally you can use your power of the purse and your power of appointment to, to f shape the direction of the university. Mm -hmm. Like when I formed the computer sciences department, and I mentioned President Hofti started molecular biology here. Uh, so one of the things that makes this job fun is that you don't have to know a lot of, about any area, but in order to shape a university, you have to have some understanding how different fields of knowledge are moving and what's going to be important. Good point. Uh, and that, that's a lot of fun. Well, for me, at least, it was a lot of fun. And you're able to meet, you know the challenges and you're able to meet them well, you know, the opportunities. For instance, right now I would feel that psychology is going to be very interesting because as the insights from the molecular biology become more available, and they are becoming more available to study the human brain, 
psychology will move from a discipline where they had a black box and measured the input and output to a discipline where they will understand the pieces of that black box and what's taking place. That should be a very exciting period. That's right. Good point. And, uh, well, so, um, back to the buildings. What, did fundraising come in? Were there, how, was, that, was there any fundraising connected with some of these buildings? That were yeah, there was fundraising connected, but I'm, in all fairness, deans in my day did less fundraising than they do today. Okay. Uh, the fundraising was more done centrally, and it was also done, uh, of course, at, at the present half the university largely they relied on state funds. Okay. Um, but it worked very well for, for many years. For many years, the state legislatures either didn't understand or it chose to ignore the difference between average cost and marginal cost. So if you got 6% more students, your funding was increased by 6% more, even though the extra 6% didn't cost as much as the first 94%. And really, when you look at the history of the state universities, how, that, how, that's how many of the distinguished features were built, the music school at IU, the biochemistry department, the University of Wisconsin, the state legislatures didn't really decide on what they were going, to, what was going to happen to the institutions, but they were quite satisfied to live by the formula where universities got percent, two percentage increases, one for inflation and the other one for the extra students. Now, by the by the by the seventies, this no longer worked. The, the legislatures became. Uh, mm -hmm. became more careful in allocating funds. Right. So and, and the to there was really very little private fundraising. Uh, it was on the hands that private fundraising increased and I, um, I gave, uh, I did more of my, most of my fundraising when I became provost, not when I, not when I was dean. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and there I'm, uh, as provost, for instance, I... Yeah, and we can move into the provost. You want to talk a little bit about that? Or, when as provost, you know. for instance, I would, when Dr. Hanson couldn't go to Florida, we, the, the president took an annual trip to Florida where he, where he moved every day and spoke at the, to alumni groups, to different alumni groups every day. So you would, you would go swimming in the morning and move in the afternoon and talk. And there were a couple of years when Dr. Hanson couldn't go, so I took his place. And, uh, you know... It's farthest to say whether I did well or not, but I, I tried. And I, uh, but fundraising, I think, is also connected to how well you understand what the university is trying to achieve. If you have a, 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 a precise and, 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 and clear notion of what, what you're doing, and in, in the language of business, you know what your business is. So you can explain to them what you're trying to do and what the difference will be if you have a certain amount of extra money or if you won't have it. Right. So that knowing what to do about the universities related to raising funds for it. And uh, It works in conjunction. Uh, and I had a, when I was provost, I had a fairly clear vision of what the university should do. Now, I must, I must make it clear that both as a dean and as a provost, I didn't operate in isolation. I had very good presidents, without whom none of what I did would have been possible. And, of course, one of the tricks of any, in any organization is that is, you need to understand what decisions your superior wants to make himself or herself and what decision he doesn't want to be bothered with. So as a provost, you need to understand what decisions the president wants reserved for himself and what decisions he doesn't want to make. Mm -hmm. So certainly defining the direction of the university was something that was done in conjunction with the president and others. Mm -hmm. And uh, Well, the provost was, uh, was that a, that was a new position. It was a new when, position that Dr. Hansen Dr. established, Hansen yeah. Came, right. Dr. Hansen came here in 72, mm -hmm. and I was made provost in 74. And it was a position that, uh, uh, but which I think makes a lot of sense. The, uh, 75 years ago, the president could be primarily concerned with the internal affairs of a university. Uh, now a president really has to spend 60% of his time on the outside, raising funds and whatnot. So it's a reasonable setup to have, for a president to have two chief lieutenants, one in charge of the financial operation of the institution, one in charge of the academic operations. 
And I should say in this connection, I was lucky enough to have a counterpart in the financial areas, Fred Ford, who was very much interested in having a great university here. And there's one particular year I remember when we got, very, when we got a very bad budget from the state. And Ford came to me and said, Phil, he says, let's give the faculty all the salary increase. It's more important there than any place else. So he was very sympathetic to building a university. And this, mm -hmm. that, that helped. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't mean that you don't occasionally have disagreements. Oh, sure. But it means you but have the same goal. The same goal. Right, yes. And I think it was possible, to, as I said, in fundraising and in cooperation with my f fellow officers of the university, to excite people at the concept of having a great institution right. here. Uh, people wanted that. Right. The legislature wanted it too. That's right. Uh, and uh, now you have to define what you mean by great. Uh, a land grant university being great does not mean that you only restrict yourself to the very best students. Uh, what you mean is that you have a, a distinguished land grant university, in our case with a technical bias, of, of, of quality. Uh, now what, what do these terms mean? The technical bias means that you have a very strong heart of the university. You don't have a university unless you have strengths in the humanities and basic sciences. But technical bias means that you don't have all the professional schools in the social sciences, but you try to have all the professional schools in the technical fields. And the comparison, of course, is always in England, Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford has the classical tradition. Cambridge has the, has the Cavendish lab. That doesn't mean that they're not both good universities. Right, exactly. So I was aiming for a distinguished uh, land-grant university with a technical bias. And land-grant meant that you don't just serve the top students' budget, but you had a responsibility, particularly in the technical fields, to serve students of a great variety of ability, top two-thirds probably. And we, we, I th hopefully we did that reasonably well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there's no contradiction between this, serving a large student, diverse student body, and having very good programs for the top 5%. You can manage the two can easily together. Yeah. And we did that, hopefully. Mm -hmm. so, that, so the provost, that was the concept I was pushing, and I, I think it was related to fundraising, related to what I was building. Uh, and that uh, provost for the researchers, that for the academic, primarily all the academic departments, uh, were under your research. Uh, well, I had them. Um, as I well had as reporting to me, uh, three vice presidents, four vice presidents actually, and all the deans. One vice president was in charge of student services. Uh, one was in charge of. Uh, 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 research, one in charge of graduate education, and one was a position I created. It's Don Brown was vice president for academic services. That means he was responsible for the libraries, the computing center, continuing educations, all the academic things that fit didn't fit a particular dean at the time. Sure. Okay. And, uh, but in, uh, I felt that people could do better in what I was trying to do if they maintained their roots in the academic department. So all the people who worked for me co continued teaching and doing research in their own department. All these people were part-time appointments in the provost's office. And I, had to, I, had to, I started to audition when I became a dean. When I was a dean, I operated with minimal administration. I had one associate dean, my name was Bill Fuller. And Bill and I each taught a course in mathematics. The third of our salary was charged to mathematics. That was the total amount of administration. And um, when I, when I, I did the same thing in the provost's offices. Surrounded myself with people who had roots in, in the academic environment. There were many advantages to this. First of all, uh, they, because they have their roots in the academic environment, their, their point of view reflects those departments, okay. and you want that reflections in the cent reflected in the central administration. Uh, secondly, they are independent because they're professors of biology or chemical engineering or history. They don't have to work for the provost. If they have a disagreement, they have they have some place to go back to. <laughs> it means they will tell you the truth. They will not. They 
they don't have to they don't have Aids to comply with, with your wishes. You get a much more honest feel, the opinion that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, thirdly, of course, I'm, to the extent to which you save money in administration, you can use it for for what I would think really counts, which are the the departments, the scholars in the various departments of the university. Right. Uh, one of the things I'm proud of when I was provost, I put the School of Nursing under the Dean of Pharmacy. I didn't want to spend, I didn't want to waste money. I felt pharmacy was a small school and one dean could handle pharmacy, nursing, and health sciences. Okay. And this will save some money for more important purposes than administration. Right. And uh, that worked out reasonably well too. Sure. The nurses were very happy initially, but they, it was the right way to do it. Right. Okay. And uh, so uh, the other thing that, that I enjoyed being provost, of course, in, in addition to working with Dr. Hansen, Dr. Ford, and, and uh, trying to do the things that I'm supposed, was supposed to do, I enjoyed the learning experience that I had of trying to understand the various parts of the university. In order to be effective in agriculture, you have to understand what the School of Agriculture is all about. Mm -hmm. And I compared this to being an anthropologist almost. You study the various cultures that make up the university, and deal with them appropriately. And the decisions you see uh, that, you, that, you, that you make in these various fields depend intimately on your understanding of the fields. Uh, the background that you In knowledge. agriculture, for instance, when I was provost, it became relatively clear that you could no longer greatly change the quality or the amount of crops by the traditional methods of um, uh, genetic manipulation in the fields. Uh, the, the two openings were molecular manipulation and food sciences, where you worried about producing food after the, uh, the, it was produced in the fields. So I got a dean, Bernie Liska, who had the same view of where agriculture should go. And of course, I was very pleased to see the other day that Phil Nelson, somebody we appointed, won a major prize for his contribution in food sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the but in general, of course, the, uh, if you do, a, uh, if you do an academic administration, you have to be able to derive your pleasures from the success of others. And that, that, no, that still that continues because I have not been done out of administration for 20 years, but I still get pleasure from seeing that the people whom I appointed have been successful, like Phil Nelson, for They've instance. Moved on, right. Because that's really the reward. And actually, that's... Um, the beginning was when I was a dean. I, I got great pleasure out of finding out what people were doing. I mentioned to you earlier that the trick is to hire good people and leave them alone. That's unless they want to talk to you. And they usually, talented people usually want to talk, and I'm interested for one or two reasons. They want resources, and you should be able to, willing to talk to them about the resources. But the other thing they want from you is to be a father image, in the case of a female president, or a mother image. They want somebody to brag to, and that's your second role in interaction with talented people. Uh, so, so some of my most rewarding moments came when, for instance, Michael Rossman, very distinguished biologist, one evening I was working in a mathematical sciences building on the top there, came up around 8 p.m. and. and he was terribly excited. He had just finished analyzing the second virus. And he found that there are certain pieces in the structure of the second virus that analyzed, which was the same as in the, other, in the first virus that analyzed. And it was his feeling that these pieces had to go back to, to the earliest days of evolution. And you know, for, to have a guy like this sort of pour out his excitement to you is one of the rewards of being a dean. Yeah, it's very nice. Uh, and when Louis de Branche was a mathematician whom I hired, solved a, a classical problem. Uh, and uh, he was in Russia at the time and he solved it and he came back. He came to the provost's office to tell me about it. And I must confess I enjoyed that. Yeah. What was your reaction when you heard about the uh, Nobel laureate when Dr. Brown got that? You, uh, yeah, I enjoyed it yeah. very much and I, I worked very hard to keep Brown here. I, uh, uh, Again, I mean, again, I mean, yeah. it may, maybe a maybe a funny, funny and unimportant story, but it, it, it's a true story. 
And I was head of mathematics, I had a secretary who was a first-rate secretary, uh, but uh, it was rather hard, difficult to deal with for the, for the faculty. So when I became dean, of then man who became head of mathematics said he, the condition was that he got himself a different secretary. Well, Herb Brown was looking at the secretary for time, and they transferred that woman to Herb Brown. She was ideal for him because she was a first-rate typist, and Brown didn't want to be bothered with people, and she kept everybody away from him, you see. She, she was the right match. And it, when he won the Nobel Prize, he took her to Stockholm with him. Nice. Oh, nice, yes. So that worked out. Right. Uh, We're very fortunate that all the papers and everything that he had all went we, the library got them, got the collection, and they're yeah. working on it now, which is really yeah, but nice. But, you know, there, there's a uh, sort of... The other thing that, that underlies my pleasure here is uh, my relation with students. I was going to ask you. I, I enjoy young people. I've always enjoyed young people, and I've always taught. Would you teach when you were uh, dean as well as pro? I was when I was dean. At one time, I wanted to teach two courses, but my late wife, Alan, says, you can't do this. You're scared. The rest of the faculty don't want you to teach two courses. But I, t I always taught a course. And then I, when I was provost, I taught a course every semester. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the pleasure of teaching, of course, was teaching mathematics was that I just had to be right. There were no human relations involved. In everything else I did, I not only had to be right, but I had convinced 20 people that I was right. Teaching mathematics, I just didn't know what I was doing. So I taught all along, and I really enjoy Purdue students. And I've tried to figure out why. And I think it's because they're bright kids, but they're not arrogant. They, those who are very bright, don't know that they're very bright, and they've never been told they're part of some kind of an elite. And they, they know that they've come in, work hard, and it's just very pleasant to I think that has to do with the fact that um, engineering is a profession in particular that attracts lower middle class people, not upper class people. Upper class people want to be physicians or lawyers, not particularly engineers. So you get these bright children of the lower middle class, and they're, they're ideal students. And uh, after, I, after I stepped out of the provost job, I, was, I t taught in the mathematics department for, for five years. I taught three courses because I felt I was not doing research, so I should teach more than other people. And then I retired. Uh, well, my second retirement was in 81, the first time I retired when I was provost. I retired in 81 when, when I was 70. and. Uh, Oh, 91, 91, 91. And uh, then for the following 12 years, 14 years, I guess, I taught a course without pay because I liked the kids. And uh, Were you uh, primarily undergraduates or graduates? Or well, I taught younger? everything that would oh. I, I tried very hard since I was dean and provost not to push people around. So my attitude in the mathematics department was give me whatever you want to give me. Okay. But uh, in the last few years, um, last four or five years, I taught primarily undergraduates, uh -huh. and uh, enjoyed that very much. Yeah. And uh, I also did some counseling, which I enjoyed. I, when I was dean, in order to better understand what was going on in the school, I, I wanted to counsel about 20 students as a, as a source of information on what was happening in the school. And I enjoyed that very much. Mm -hmm. and I, I've used that, the knowledge I acquired then and the skills in advising my grandchildren, who don't take my advice, but I can use it anyhow. <laughs> and I, I basically, basically, I would tell kids, uh, find out what you, there's three criteria in picking what you do. First of all, it has to be something that you enjoy, because uh, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to be happy. Secondly, you have to be something that, that you're reasonably good. And then if you find something that you, at which you're reasonably good, that you enjoy, it ought to be reasonably socially use, useful. And if it's reasonably socially useful, that's fine. That combination is enough for picking a field. <laughs> and, uh, Tell us a little about your, uh, your family. You've got a couple of children. you have some children? I have three kids, uh -huh. uh, none of whom went to Purdue, uh, for what I think is the right, the right reason. 
they felt they did not want to interact with a lot of people with whom their parents had relations and knew their parents very well. Uh, and uh, I have one son who became a physician who practices medicine in, near Boston. Uh, he was an undergraduate at MIT, as a matter of fact, and then he went to medical school at the University of California in San Francisco. He's now practicing medicine. He's an endocrinologist. And I have a daughter who's in the middle who's a, who, who rebelled. All my kids rebelled. Since my first, my late wife, Violet, was a mathematician too, they wanted to be different from their parents. They all started to, to, all trying to do something as different as possible from their parents as possible. And, uh, but then at some point they all discovered that the genes do tell to some extent that they, that they were completely free to do what they wanted to do. But my daughter announced when she was in high school she was going to be a physical education teacher. And I think to her surprise I said, that's great. Be a, be a good physical education teacher. And she went to Arizona to study physical education, but also because she it would enable her to swim all year, which she liked to do. Uh, but lo and behold, she took some mathematics courses and took some economics courses. I was reasonably good at it, so in her senior year, someone named Lester Thoreau, who was at the time, was a very distinguished MIT economist, visited Arizona and for a semester and had a seminar and he discovered her and then she went to MIT to do graduate work. And uh, my, third, my second son is an engineer who is, uh, lives in New Jersey. And, uh, and he has some grandchildren. I have seven grandchildren. Mm -hmm. My oldest son is three. Uh, the, all of whom have gone to Harvard, not to MIT, because the mother went to Harvard and the mother prevailed. I lost. <laughs> and I, and then I'm a, my daughter has two children who are very nice children. Uh, the, they live in, they started in New York City. My daughter married a man who had never been out of Manhattan in his life and who didn't <laughs> want to leave Manhattan. And, but she eventually, when the children didn't, the older child didn't do so well in the schools, they moved to Westchester. And, uh, they now own a house that, this, that's a funny story too, they bought a house it was built by Boxy Siegel. I don't know if they remember that name. It was a gangster. It was a particularly vicious gangster. And the house was built around 34, because that was the time when only gangsters had money to buy, build houses. So they it's very luxurious. Uh, well, it's, it has it has a, some features. It has a <laughs> it has a there's a gate between the f basement and the first floor an iron gate that you can close with a button from your bedroom, <laughs> which most houses wouldn't have. And, uh, and, uh, For the activity down the lower level. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but they, 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 they have, that she has two children, a son who is uh, 16, who just passed his driving test, and a daughter who is 15, 14. Mm -hmm. My youngest son has two children. Uh, he has a son who is going to the Naval Academy this fall just accepted into the Naval Academy. He's going to Annapolis. Very and nice. he's, they have a daughter, there's a daughter who is also 15 now. Yeah. So I have seven grandchildren and I, that's, that's one of the dilemmas in my life. Uh, I like living in Lafayette. I think this is a great place and I don't want to leave. But by living here, I separate myself from my children and grandchildren. And there's a prize in that. I don't know the grandchildren as well as I would like to. Mm -hmm. I brought them here in the summer without, for two or three weeks at a time without their parents. I thought that was a good way to, to get to know them. But still, it's, it's not a substitute for being with them. As a family. As yeah. a family. Mm -hmm. But as of now, we're going to stay in Lafayette because we just think this is a great place. That's when I was provo dean and provost, I had to say so. Professionally, the fact faculty convinced them that this was, a, this was a better place to live than Boulder, Colorado, or wherever. But I believe it. It's, 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 it's a very agree. nice place. Right. Um, we asked, uh, one other thing I had asked before uh, about the, the hall was named after you. You were quite surprised. It's a nice thing. The, the hall that was named yes. after you, it's very nice. 
And when the president called you, you were surprised, were you not? I was surprised. That's and nice. I, I, again, I, I was initially demurred because I wasn't sure that this was appropriate, but I was convinced it was, and I, and I'm, I'm, I enjoy it very much. I mean, I, when I, when I go someplace and some and some guy says his office is in Haas, and that's that's very pleasant. You know, I must confess, I, we none of us lose this sort of uh, need for cheap appropriation. I, I know some very distinguished people whom we give honorary degrees to. And I honor them, why do they want an honorary degree? I mean, they have all kinds of great accomplishments. But they enjoyed it, and I, sure. I, enjoy, I enjoy very much having a name, yeah. the hall named after yeah, me. That's I, very nice. And, uh, you're, going to, you're going to tell us what your um, long, outstanding event in your life? You got any outstanding event that you can recall? Or a, fa a favorite memory of Purdue, one or the other? Oh, well. You really addressed quite a few, but you might have one that perhaps you hadn't shared yet. Well, I mean, one of my, I'm not sure that, you know, it's, it's hard to rank memories. Sure. So I may, Good point. I may tell you a few that um, it pleased me. I had an associate by the name of Luther Williams, who was a black biologist. And MIT had him away from me, which annoyed me. And, uh, and when he came back, he said just the right things. He said, Phil, I'm coming back. MIT wants me because I'm black. You want me because I'm a good biologist. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's nice. And uh, a few moments like this, when I think that I mentioned to you my experience when the branch had proved the Bieberbach conjecture when he came to my office. Right. I think that I must confess that I'm, I made enemies over the years. See, the, the one area where I felt it was worth making enemies over was in quality control. In quality control, you sometimes clashed with people, as a provost, you sometimes clashed with deans or department heads. And that was, uh, you know, by and large, I'm reasonably good at human relations. I try to get along with people. But when, when a dean pushes for the promotion of somebody and you think it's a mistake, there's no way to do this without a clash. Yeah. And uh, it's hard. Uh, uh, I think I paid a price for this, but it was necessary. I stood up for calling. And of course, the people I appreciated working for me were the people where I didn't have to clash, where I didn't have to do it. Somebody like Sam Conte, his instincts for quality were such that in all the years I dealt with Sam, I never once had to say no to him. That, of course, made it much easier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I hope we have, uh, hope I've made a contribution to the university and I, I certainly enjoyed working here very much. Yes, very good. Uh, anything in closing? And I think that we really appreciate. I we do want to mention the regional campuses. Oh yes, because you brought it up in your conversation. I was going to ask you. If and you I felt to then they had not adequately responded to it. Go ahead. Okay. I think that the regional campuses too. You want to aim for excellence, but use a different standard. What you mean by excellence in these places? And I was very much interested in helping the regional campuses. Which develop, were already in place when you... Which were in place. Mm -hmm. um, I say that for the particular researchers. Particular, in now. Michigan City, I, may, I think I helped, may, made some changes. They had, a, they, had a, they, had, they had some difficulties there, and I think I helped them. The chancellor, of the, uh, the chancellor of the Calumet campus for many years was somebody I recommended. My relations were so good with the people at Calumet. And I remember this, this guy's Jim Nieko, who had been an associate assistant dean for me here. And when, I, when they were looking for chancellor for Calumet, and I recommended Jim Nieko, they appointed him chancellor. And I think he did well there. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the fun. But again, again, you had to be very sensitive to, not to interfere with the operations of these people. I remember that one day there was a promotions meeting in Indianapolis, and it was icy. The road was terrible. And the, the people in the car with me were annoyed because I was not slowing down in view to respond to the conditions of the road. But I told them, I said, the resent are coming anyhow. We cannot afford to be late for the Indianapolis promotion meeting. So you have to be very sensitive in de dealing with the regional campus, but it is an important part of what you do. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, the reason I'm bringing this up because when I mentioned to you the definition of what Purdue is, I was really referring to the Lafayette campus. Right, exactly. Now, the regional for the research at the regional campuses when you were provost reported to to you. Me, yes. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the, that was the, it was a complicated relation. Technically, the chancellors reported to the president, but they reported to me through me for academic things and through Fred Ford for financial things. For the research, that clarifies yeah. it, okay. Right. okay. So I was responsible for faculty and appointments and research in the regional campuses. Mm -hmm. And they've done very well for the state, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're pretty as I, as, I, as, as I told you earlier, and I don't want to retract the statement, I wish the state had a junior college system mm -hmm. because more people would go to colleges, to the universities, and more... Okay. Uh, pre-professional education would be available around the state, right, yeah. but um, that's uh, that's a lack. I think a model for what what's good is the California system, mm -hmm. where they have the university system, the state college system, and the junior colleges. Right, yeah. But uh, the, the state has done well in higher education. People don't know. You wouldn't believe it, but this state, I don't know what the situation is today. Most of my knowledge is dated. But in the years when I was provost, this state put out more PhDs in engineering and science than any state except California and New York. Uh, because we had, of course, Indiana University, Notre Dame, and Purdue. And okay. between those three institutions, we put out more PhDs in engineering and science. And for instance, Massachusetts. So the state has made its co yeah. contribution through higher education. And I think that I'm very pleased that uh, President Yishki and the incoming presidents are very aware of the need to work with the state and for the state right. in higher education because I, I do believe that this is uh, from a broader economic perspective. Uh, our country would, uh, since our country has lost a lot of manufacturing st jobs, it would be worse off than we are even if, if we hadn't led in the new science and technology. Right. Yeah. And I think we need to do this uh, because it's, it is very hard to go back to, a, to an economy which is primarily based on manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Of course, agriculture shrunk too, but that was inevitable. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but <coughs> the, um, it's, uh, again, of course, I think that we need to be careful. This has nothing to do with my job as provost. I think in this, when we, as we build a, as we build a uh, worldwide uh, free trade and automation, we need to make sure that most people benefit from it. If enough people are losers under the system of globalization and automation, okay. it's not going to work because people will revolt, and they should revolt if they're rational. That's right. So we need to make sure, as we have globalization and automation, that other countries adopt minimum wage standards and things like this. Avoid child labor and all this. Otherwise, it's, it's, there are too many losers. Right, yeah. This had nothing to do with my job as, as provost, but since you gave me this forum, I thought I would let go. Oh, I appreciate that. Any, any, I think that's very nice. We appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Haas. You're welcome. My pleasure.